Hey everybody, this is Kimberly, anti-diet coach, holistic nutritionist, and self-empowerment aficionado. And you're listening to the Love Your Naked Ass podcast, the show that helps women just like you ditch their diets, kick their inner critic to the curb, and make peace with their bodies so they can focus on what's important in life, living it. Let's get started. Hey, hey, welcome to the first episode of Love Your Naked Ass. I can't tell you how excited I am to have you here with me today and to share this episode with you. This has been a long time coming. I've wanted to create a podcast for years. And the truth is I was afraid to hit record. So I'm sure with a title like Love Your Naked Ass, you probably have some questions like, who the hell is this girl? And what the heck is this show going to be about? Well, listen, I can answer these questions in various ways, but let me start with this. I am just like you. I'm a wife. I've been married for 17 years. I've been with him, hmm, I think 25 at this point. So more than half my, half my life, I'm a mom. I have a gorgeous 14-year-old teenager. He is awesome. He's a very well-rounded, very kind child. I'm so lucky to be his mom. And of course, I'm completely biased. I'm a fur mom. I have three little ones here. I have two Yorkies and a Morky. And they, they, they are the entourage I never really wanted. Just kidding. No, seriously. They are my entourage. They are my protectors. They follow me everywhere. I can't even pee in private. I'm a recovered anorexic which we're going to get to in a bit. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story, and I'm sure I'll be sharing bits and pieces throughout every episode as we move forward. I'm also a breast cancer survivor. And honestly, ladies, I had my first mammogram and I thought my husband was punking me. I could not believe I heard the C word. And again, I'm sure I'll be talking about that in an upcoming episode. Currently, I work a nine to five job and I'm obviously here with you starting this podcast, but I also have a health coaching practice that I'm building, or actually I should say rebuilding in the evening. So my nine to five, I manage a digital advertising house. And then of course, my health coaching practice is all about making you feel amazing. We talk about nutrition. We talk about self-care. We talk about self-love and how to kick your inner critic's voice to the curb. Listen, the most important thing I want you to learn of who I am is that I'm a girl on a mission. And we don't know each other that well yet, but I got to tell you, you talk to any of my girlfriends, they will tell you when I'm on a mission, watch out. My goal in life is to leave a mark on the world. It's, it's essentially to leave the world in a better place. A few months ago, I'll quick tell you a story that kind of made me giggle. I was talking to my son. I was picking him up from track practice and it was a long track practice. He was all sweaty and he was sitting there and he kind of looked annoyed and I didn't really talk to him. And then all of a sudden he opened up his mouth and he was like, when I get older, I'm going to be a millionaire. And he was talking about his future. And you know how kids are. They think they're going to be like the next Xbox superstar or they're going to be, you know, the next professional Michael Jordan and dominate the basketball court or the football field or whatnot. My son wants to be the next Hussein Bolt. But anyway, I digress. So we were talking about this and he was telling me all about this story he had conjured up in his head about how much money he was going to make and what kind of car he wanted to drive and all the things. And I kind of giggled and said, huh, that sounds awesome. And he said, yeah, and I'm going to make so much money. I'm not going to know what to do with it. I was like, again, awesome goals. But let me ask you a question. What mark are you going to leave on the world? He kind of looked at me puzzled and he said, what? And I said, seriously, at the end of the, your life, nobody really cares about what you did for a living. What impression do you want to leave? How do you want people to see you or remember you by? And he's like, I don't know. And he's like, how do you want to be seen? And without any hesitation, I turned to him and said, easy. 
I want to help women and show women how amazing they really are without having to change anything about themselves. My son kind of laughed and he scratched his head and he said, well, mom, you're going to have to come up with something new because you already do a great job of doing that. Got to love that kid, right? But I have to tell you that conversation, that one conversation that was what? A five minute banter between a mom and her son is literally the precipice for this podcast. It was the pin that stuck, right? Because I said I wanted to start a podcast for years and I was too afraid of probably what people thought. The good news is maybe it's age, maybe it's because I'm wiser, maybe it's because of my life experience. I don't give a shit what people think of me anymore. But what I do want is to leave a legacy, even if it's helping change the world one woman at a time. So this show is my way of leaving a mark on the world. Like I said, if I can help one woman, maybe that's you, stop using the scale as a way to measure your worth, just throw it out the window. If I can help you see the absurdity of starting another diet come Monday morning, let's be clear, ladies, you can start again tomorrow. We don't need to wait till Monday. I'm not sure where that came from. That's just a pet peeve of mine. If I can help you change the way you speak to yourself, I mean, let's think about this, ladies. Would you talk to your best friend the way you talk to yourself? Hell no. I mean, seriously, we're the meanest people to ourselves. It's got to stop. And if I can help you finally look in the mirror and love what you see back, then guess what? I accomplished my goal. I get goosebumps talking about this. I mean, this is it at its heart. I want you to see what an amazing human being you are just because you exist. And you're going to hear me say that a lot. But for now, before we get into my story and the bits and pieces I want to share with you in today's episode, let's just promise each other this. I'm going to ask that we have a conversation when you and I get together. With each episode, you're going to get to hear more of my why behind Love Your Naked Ass, more of my story. And I also imagine and hopeful that you're going to ask me questions so I can have the pleasure of answering those questions. And I honestly foresee interviewing other women, luminaries who not only shine their light on the world in their own way, but also have a really powerful story that got them there. So to mark my first episode, I want to share part of my personal story. It is the beginning. (laughs) And I'm going to ask you to bear with me because I may end up shedding some tears. I cannot talk about this typically without getting a little bit choked. But if I'm going to ask you to get vulnerable, then I damn well better too. So let's start from the beginning. My defining moment happened 30 years ago, totally aging myself right now. (laughs) I was 16, a junior in high school. To give you some background, I was a normal teenage girl. Well, normal's relative, right? Straight A student. I had an after school job. I was involved in school sports. I played basketball and ran track. And I had lots of friends. Although I know I was fairly moody, but duh, hello, teenage years. Aren't we all moody when we're teenagers? And I know I definitely had an attitude with my parents, but come on, again, teenager. I remember feeling pretty happy. Until one night, it was late. I was at a friend's house. There were other girls there too. We were downstairs watching a movie when there was a knock on the door. And my girlfriend and I went upstairs and it happened to be her boyfriend and mine. Mine was certainly uninvited because we had been fighting. And strangely, what I remember most about that night was that it was cold, windy, and raining. And I remember standing in the kitchen and we were arguing 
And to be honest with you, after 30 years, I don't remember what the argument was actually about. I mean, what do you argue about when you're 16? I don't even recall exactly what I said, but I know I was angry and I know I asked him to leave. He refused and got a little irate with me, which didn't sit well with me at all. Because even back then, I took very little shit from people. But the next thing I knew, I felt the handle of the refrigerator in my back. He was so angry at me, he grabbed my arm, and when I pulled away, he pushed me. And that kind of was the last straw for me at that time. Told him it was over, and I was like, I don't want to date anymore. This isn't working out for me. I know I got an apology, something along the lines of, I'm sorry, don't do this. And he started to get loud. And I started to get a little bit squirmish because like I said, there were other people in the house and I wasn't even in my own home. So he had asked if he could talk some more and in lieu of where I was and in the situation I found myself in, I thought, okay, I'll hear him out because he's getting loud and I don't want to wake people up. Like I said, it was late at night. So we walked into this other room across the house near the garage. I'm pretty sure it was near the garage and it doesn't even matter, but this is just my recollection of this night. He started apologizing and rubbing my arm. And then it was like a freaking blur, like within a matter of minutes, I found myself pinned underneath him. And I remember pushing and pulling and like trying to get out from underneath him but I couldn't. And I know I tried to scream and I know words came out of my mouth, but they were so quiet. I could barely hear them. And I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like that, but it's just like, I felt fucking helpless. Like I felt helpless. Everything after that kind of just goes dark, to be honest with you. I remember getting up and he wasn't there. He, he ran off. Like I, I, I did finally get out from underneath his hold, but the next memory that I have from that night is literally me sitting in the bathroom on the toilet, holding a hand towel, cleaning myself up and recognizing that there's blood stains on this towel. That wasn't mine. When I stood in front of the mirror that evening, it was like I was looking at a stranger. I couldn't even recognize who was staring back at me. It was the strangest feeling. It was so unnerving. The person looking back at me was so angry and they didn't fit in the mirror. And that sounds absurd. Because you, a mirror is a reflection of yourself. And I'm five foot eight, 120 pounds. Like I should fit in the mirror. And this person looking back at me did not. And I didn't really think much of it at the time. All I know is that I knew I had to collect myself and find my way back downstairs without anyone knowing anything had happened. So I took that hand towel. I wrapped it in a ball, shoved it in my sweatshirt threw it in my bag when I got downstairs and cried myself to sleep. Fast forward a few months later, it was like nothing had happened. I literally buried that so deep. I told no one. The one girlfriend who was asking me some questions, who I think to this day still has an idea, gave me some lame ass excuse of boys will be boys. And I just shut down. So I pretended it didn't happen. And I thought that I went, I did a good job, right? I thought that I was over it, that I had moved through it, that I was fine with everything. And the truth was that I wasn't. I spent my whole entire senior year in self-destruction mode and didn't even realize it. And what really ended up happening was through the denial and the shame and the guilt that I had felt around this incident, 
all I really did was open up a can of worms that led me down this crazy path, this path that led to anorexia, to body dysmorphia, and exercise bulimia. In the beginning, listen, it was innocent. It started with exercising and then a little bit of over-exercising. I mean, listen, I never exercised outside of my sport, my athletics from school. So I would go to practice. I would hang out with my friends and we'd go to the park and go hiking, but I wasn't like a avid exerciser. I didn't go to the gym yet or, you know, do those VHS tapes. Yes, I'm totally dating myself again. Or you know, putting in a DVD to an exercise workout routine. It just didn't happen. But all of a sudden, here I am waking up at three o'clock in the morning, inserting the VHS, working out for 45 minutes, and then pretending to go back to bed. So my parents thought I was still asleep to wake up at six and do the same thing over again, walking downstairs, putting the VHS in, exercising for an additional 45 minutes. And that was all before school. At that point, I was just over-exercising. Then I found running, and I would run a mile. Then it was two, then it was three, then it was five, then it was 10. And hell, by the time I went to college, I was running 22 miles for fun. Then the food issues started. Because what I realized with exercise is that I was changing my body, and it was something that I could control and something that took up space in my day. What I know now is the fact that I used it as a scapegoat to deal with that night. It's funny how you learn things later in life and you sit there and you're like, wow. If I knew then what I know now, right? So back to my food. Once I realized I could manipulate my body through exercise, I started to wonder how it would feel if I controlled my food. And I didn't, I didn't wake up one morning and be like, I'm going to control my food. No, not at all. It was completely like, just started to happen. It's not something I set out to do, but once it started, I could not stop. I would hide food. I would flush it down the toilet. I would throw it in the trash can. I would pretend to eat in front of my parents and move food around. It would not be abnormal for me to sneak downstairs in the middle of the night to exercise. It was not abnormal for me to lay in bed at night and do a thousand leg lifts on the left and a thousand leg lifts on the right. It was pretty crazy. And then college got came and I went off to college and it inherently got worse. Now, college is supposed to be this great time of your life, Right. You have this newfound freedom and you have this autonomy that you never had before. And in my circumstances, it just perpetuated the illness. It perpetuated my issues without having parents around to kind of monitor my behavior. It just got worse. At one point, I was literally working out six hours a day and eating a bagel with jelly. And if I got hungry in the evening, I used coffee to curb my appetite. So here I am, completely drained, physically just burnt out, hopped up on caffeine with no nutrients in my body. So, of course, my academics were starting to suffer. Of course they were. I was a straight A student. So going from a straight A student to a C or even a D student, that wasn't who I was. That was a sign for me that there was a huge issue. I remember this one time, I don't even remember the class and it really, it doesn't matter, but there was this one class that I was not doing well in. In fact, I think I was on the verge of failing it. I know I had a D in it. I might've even been failing the class. All I know is that I needed to get an A on this next exam so I could pull my grade up. So when my parents looked at my grades, they wouldn't bite my head off. And I remember studying for days and I kept reading the same thing over and over and over again because I couldn't concentrate because I had no nutrients to feed my brain. I literally was hoping that I would learn from holding the book. And then the worst happened. I fell asleep the night before the exam, almost didn't wake up to take the exam with the book on my head 
praying and hoping that I would learn through osmosis. Can you imagine? It's that moment that I finally admitted I had a problem to my family and friends. Now, they already knew I had a problem. It was not a secret, although I thought it was. Afterwards, I found out that everyone knew I had issues. Even I knew I had issues. I mean, secretly, I had sought out a school therapist months before. So here it was, February 14th, 1995. The school counselor called my parents and explained what was going on. And I immediately followed up with a phone call to let them know that I needed help and that I needed to come home. I left college and never looked back. Two weeks after I got home, I was admitted to an eating disorder treatment facility in Philadelphia. I was in that facility for approximately 30 days. And then I spent another year in outpatient therapy at the same treatment facility, driving to and from Philadelphia twice a week. Now, ultimately, there's more to this story, and I'm sure I will get into more details in later episodes. But what I want you to know now is that I did eventually, through this treatment process, get better. I did go back to college. I changed my major. I went from journalism to psychology, thinking I was going to help other girls who had eating disorders. I ended up graduating with honors, which is well more in line with who I am as a person. I became a personal trainer during that time as well, and then went back to school to get my master's in holistic nutrition And during this whole time frame within those years, I met my now husband and obviously have been with him ever since. And I have to give huge kudos to that man because he has put up with some crazy shit from me throughout the years. A lot of it stemming to my inner critic. And by the way, just so you know, Yes, life was good. I was no longer starving myself. I wasn't hiding food or flushing it down the toilet. And I wasn't working out six hours a day. I did finally find balance. Becoming a personal trainer definitely helped me understand how my body worked. And the nutrition education I received definitely reaffirmed why food is so important. And then I also learned the best foods for myself that would fuel my body. So from that perspective, life was really good. But what it didn't teach me and what therapy never really addressed was how to tame my inner critic. Because she was still there. Loud as shit and trying to cause all sorts of problems. But in the essence of time, I will leave those stories for another episode. What I will say is that it all worked out in the end. Today, I wholeheartedly love who I am and who I've become. Flaws and all. I can enjoy food without shame, guilt, or the need to punish myself. I exercise when I want to. I listen to my body when I need rest. And I know how to turn my inner critic off. Because the truth is, she never goes away. She's always going to be there trying to convince you that you're not enough. But you have to learn to tell her to shut the hell up. So what are the takeaways from today's episode? If my story can leave you with two things, they would be this. Always find the silver lining in your story. Listen, it certainly doesn't have to be as traumatic as mine, but everyone has a story, a moment, a defining second that kind of makes us who we are. And it's your job to learn from it and allow your story to help you find your purpose. I am a believer that your story can help you Hone in on what your purpose in life is. And let's be clear, there are too many people in the world today that are stuck in a job they hate, stuck in a relationship they can't stand, and wishing for something else. And what I want you to do is lean into your story. 
Because I'll be honest, if I didn't lean into mine, if that night never happened to me, I wouldn't be here with you. So although I don't wish that on anyone, I also am never going to act like it shouldn't have happened anymore. That moment gave me today and gave me the opportunity to talk to you. The second takeaway I'd love for you to have is if I can learn to love myself completely and turn my inner critic's ass on her head, so can you. And I promise I will help you do that. Ladies, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending your quality time with me here today, for allowing me the space to share my story. Truly, I'm honored. And I hope to one day return the favor. I can't wait to talk to you in our next episode. All right, that's it for this week's episode of Love Your Naked Ass. I want to thank you for being here with me and I can't wait to chat with you next week. If you love this podcast, hit subscribe, tap to rate or drop me a review. And be sure to follow me over on Instagram at Kimberly Riggins and join my free Facebook group, The Happy Healthy Body. Again, I'm Kimberly Riggins signing off, wishing you peace, love, wine, and of course, an abundance of chocolate. I'll see you next time.